Our first keynote speaker today has 20 years of experience in omni-channel marketing, brand marketing, promotions, and shopper marketing, with a mission to drive consistent yet nuanced and personalized messages from media to shelf through media, digital, shopper, promotions, merchandising, and call centers. Ken Krasnow has ser now serves as the Vice President of Omnichannel Marketing for Hankel with iconic brands like Persil, Loctite, and Schwarzkopf. Before Hankel, he had a 17-year career with PepsiCo. The man who has shown that he can do anything, having completed 12 triathlons and parenting four precocious children, We'll dive deeper into the implications of new communication technologies on organizational structure, customer journeys, and how to use data in the best ways for personalization. Please welcome Ken Krasnow. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Ken. All right. Great. Good morning, everybody. As David said, my name is Ken Krasnow, Vice President of Omnichannel at Henkel. And some of you out there may be thinking, Henkel, the knife company? No, not Henkel, the knife company. Henkel, the global CPG and B2B ad adhesives company. And while some of you may not be familiar with our corporate name, as David ran through that list of brands, all Snuggle, Renews It, Dial, Right Guard, Schwarzkopf, Loctite, these are brands you use every day. Um, and I am super, super excited to be here with you today to talk to you about a, so a topic that I'm very, very passionate about, and that's modern marketing in a shifting world. And I can't think of a better use case than Henkel, a 140-year-old company that I would say is at the beginning of this journey, but taking very bold and courageous steps to set ourselves up for success in the near term and, uh, and the long term as well. And I think David hit the nail on the head when he was talking about innovation. And I think the point, you know, the underlying theme of my presentation today is really about innovation and about how we have to think differently um, about it. It's not just in R&D and in product silos. It's in everything that we do and all the ways that we behave. Um, Regardless of where you are personally on your journey to become more of a modern marketer, I think we would all agree that we live in exciting times of fundamental technological change. Everything is changing. The way we work, the way we live, the way we play. It's absolutely staggering. When you think of all the innovation that's coming at us from startups, from research facilities, from large organizations, what was science fiction yesterday is here today in products that we couldn't imagine living without, like our Fitbits and our voice assistants and all that computational power that we have stuffed in our pockets. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Klaus Schwab, the founder and CEO of the World Economic Forum, said that we are living in um, tremendous times of opportunity or peril, and the decision is really ours. And I think that's true. Uh, from a global perspective, but also if we boil that down as marketers, for us today, it's true. And we have to ask ourselves the question, are we going to lean back on our laurels and rely on the strategies and tactics that got us to where we are today? Or are we going to lean forward and push our organizations to think differently, to act differently for better business outcomes? Um, and we don't have a ton of time to wrestle with that question. Right? Because things are moving so fast. It's not just the volume of change, it's the velocity of all the change that's coming at us. I mean, I see heads nodding in the room, right? We know it feels like an endless amount that we have to learn um, to keep pace. And our predecessors didn't have, you know, they had the luxury of time. It took 120 years, you know, for the steam engine to leave Europe. It took 50 years for the electric light bulb and the computer to scale, right? Um, and it only took seven years for the smartphone, you know, to go worldwide. So these are the, you know, industrial revolutions, the four that we've experienced. People had a lot of time to adapt in the past. That doesn't exist now. And a really funny thing happened on the way to all this modern living. We actually lost something. And if you see it under your seat, you can check under your seat. No, I'm just kidding. 
it's not there. But it's, it's probably in your heart, right? And you all know this to be true. We lost customer intimacy, right? In the old days, and uh, I'm not that old to, ex to have experienced this, maybe I did when I was a kid, you'd walk into a store and the merchant would know your name, right? He'd know what you'd purchased. He'd be able to make recommendations based on your hope, knowing your hopes, your dreams, your desires, your needs, your wants. He had, and she had, real intimate knowledge of every single consumer, and that store felt kind of warm and cozy. It was a social community, right? But as we became mass marketers, we really pulled away for the, from the consumer in, in important, fundamental ways. I mean, mass marketing, don't get me wrong, is good, right? It's created a lot of wealth. We've produced a lot of products. We've shipped these products around the world. We've made lives better, but we lost something too. We lost that intimacy. And now what are consumers saying? They're saying, I want more of that. I want more of that intimacy. I want more of that personalization. And I'm going to reward companies who give it to me, right? Um, and I guess my second question, if my first question is, are we leaning back or are we leaning in? My second question is, are we truly listening? Are we really consumer centric? Or is it just a bunch of lip service, if we're honest with, with ourselves? And I would say if you work in an organization that's primarily focused on finding the biggest platform, and this is a pretty big one here, that they can stand on to beat their chests and scream, my brand is better than that everybody else's brand, I whiten and brighten better, buy me. If our store shelves are set up for our own operational efficiency, and not to make the shopping experience, you know, one of entertainment, one of fun, one of convenience, then I would say we may not be listening enough. Because if we were truly listening, we know that younger generations are anti-ad, right? 84% of millennials don't trust traditional forms of advertising. 67% have ad blockers. They're blocking us out. 28, that number's 28% for all U.S. adults. Yet, how many companies, hey, by show of hands, who can't wait to get home, watch your favorite program, and see all those great commercials? There's not one hand being raised in the room, yet there's a lot of commercials on TV. Why is that? Why is that? Well, it's funny, because strategy always is ahead of tactics, right? When, when the radio first came out, you know, what were people doing? They were just reading on the radio. When TV came out, people were talking to a microphone into the, into the TV, right? When the internet came out, what were people doing? They were taking their TV and their print and just putting it online, right? So we're kind of in that same place. People are telling us, you know, enough with the interruption. Engage me more. Yet that's what we're doing, you know? We're doing, we're, we're not, there's such an opportunity for us to do more engagement, less interruption, a real opportunity. If we were really listening to consumers, we'd know they can smell a sales pitch a mile away, right? We would know that 71% are turned off by salesy content. They want more meaningful content. They're screaming to be entertained, to be inspired, right? But we can't just, we can't resist. We just got to get that brand benefit out one more time, right? There's a place for brand benefits in talking about that. We don't have to talk about that everywhere. Um, if we're really honest with ourselves and we're really listening to consumers, we know consumers expect brands to be helpful. They want meaningful content, and I think this is a great example of American Express um, Open Forum. This is a hub that enables small, small businesses to go online and learn from practice leaders, big corporations who will teach them tips and tricks and life hacks to be more efficient and effective in their business practices. So here's where American Express isn't talking about the features and benefits of the card. They're talking about something related. It's added value content that over the long haul will differentiate them and make them a beloved brand. You know, 75% of consumers expect consistency. Uh, and, and, and that's a big part of what I try to do every day in my omni-channel practice, which we'll talk more about. And, and then the majority of consumers want this. This is what I'm really passionate about. They want value-driven companies. This is beyond the discrete charitable you know, um, association that we have. 
Those are great, and we should keep doing those and do more of those. But what companies want is they want brands that have values at their core. I think Starbucks is a fa fabulous example of this, right? Because Starbucks, their value system is built around their business model, is built around the value of human connection. They've created the third destination for people to connect. There's the home, there's the workplace, and now there's Starbucks on every single corner. And Starbucks keeps building on that, right? They are now, you know, the, their local marketing efforts have become, you know, renowned for the, their ability to touch communities in really meaningful ways. You know, I was talking to Alexis from YouthGen, who's sitting here in the front, and, and she, her whole, you know, her whole um, life is built around her business of helping underserved youth. And um, boy, that just makes me think, wow, what could brands do? You don't have to create it all on your own. You could reach out to, to, to good people like Alexis and others who are working in this space. You know, laundry is a big piece of, um, of our universe, right? We, we, most of our business, a third of our business is laundry in the U.S. at Henkel. And you might say, well, laundry, that's low engagement, right? You know, people do that every day. It's pretty mundane. But did you know that in underserved communities, kids don't go to school much of the time because their clothes are dirty and they're embarrassed, right? So is that low engagement? Or is that an opportunity for a company to really lean in and make empowerment, you know, part of their core value system? How could we empower the youth, right? How could we provide them with clean clothing? right, an opportunity, boy, that just gives me shivers up my spine. And I think doing this type of work will galvanize employees and shareholders and consumers alike. So I think it's a tremendous opportunity for all of us. And boy, we better listen. We better listen because almost three-fourths of consumers wouldn't care if brands just disappeared, fell off the face of the earth, right? Private label is exponentially growing, particularly with youth right, particularly with youth, so we've got to listen. And there are some companies that are listening really well. And you'll see these ads, and I'm sure you're feeling a little bit of a tingle when you see them, and that tingle tells you that they got it, right? That they really got it, they're hitting something really important. Some brands are listening so well, they're disrupting entire industries. I mean, look at the precipitous decline of the Fortune 500. Back in 1938, if you were a Fortune 500 company, you could feel pretty good, you're gonna live to 100. Today, that's about 20 years on average, right? Because some companies are listening and they're eating other companies for breakfast. Which one do we want to be? And there's really no excuse not to listen anymore. Do you know 90%, you probably know this because there's a lot of smart people in the room, but 90% of the world's data, right, was generated in the last five years. We have tremendous data. Consumers are leaving their footprints and breadcrumbs for us everywhere they go. And we have the means by which to collect all this data, structured, unstructured data, and bring it into artificial intelligence, into machine learning, to really understand not what people say, but what they do, right? Um, and boy, the need, as I said before, it couldn't be greater because remember that purchase funnel that a lot of us who kind of grew up in the 80s um, relied so much on? Well, that purchase funnel, as of course you all know, is completely broken, it's gone. The consumer path to purchase now is unique to every individual and extremely messy. There's no way to predict, you know, we can get close, we can build models, and we should, but it's super important that we're leveraging all the data at our fingertips so that we can solve our problem. In this room, this is our new problem, right? Deliver the right message to the right consumer at the right time, within the right context. And if you're not listening to the consumer, and if you're not a consumer-centric organization, I'm not sure how you'd be able to do that. So Henkel, um, what are we doing? You know, I said we're on this journey. We're at the beginning stages of this journey. Um, and, you know, the first thing we did was we said, you know, we want to be consumer-centric. And we said, let's boil down the consumer to 10 things that we can just spread around the organization. Everybody can kind of know what's really important, right, generally speaking. Well, we know the consumer, she's always on. And as a result, she wants commerce everywhere, right? She's in control, so she wants great user experiences. She doesn't need to stand for anything less than that. Um, she's expecting a lot. 
So we need to deliver personalized messages. Right? She's impatient, so she wants to be engaged. Don't interrupt her. And she's value conscious, which of course means price, but it means something more than that too, value beyond price, right? And so at Hankel, we boiled that down even further into four pillars to lead our consumer-centric strategy. And these pillars, as I stand on a pillar, but I'm going to get down, it's a little, makes me a little nervous. Um, these pillars value personalization, convenience, experiences. These aren't new, right? You know, that merchant that I showed you in that picture was dealing with the same things back in the 30s that we're dealing with today, but we have to deal with them in different ways, right? So experiences, that's where I'm going to start, because experiences starts with all of us, okay? Um, and at Hankel, we knew that, and we, we looked in the mirror, and we said, are we set up to deliver great consumer experiences from media to shelf, telling a nuanced story that's connected right, but different and helpful? And we said, absolutely not. We were set up to deliver some really good broken experiences, lots of dead ends, lots of frustration for consumers. And, and then we said, well, what are we going to do about that? And the leaders in our organization, I'm so proud of them, they put the, some of them put their pride in their pocket. And they, and, and they gave up some responsibility. And they gave it to me, which I was very happy about. Um, and we put media digital marketing, shopper marketing, in-store merchandising, national promotions, the consumer call center, and packaging design in one group, the omni-channel group. Who does that? It's very unusual, in, you know, and certainly in this country, and I think around the globe, because everybody wants to hold on to their little fiefdom, because we're really not as consumer-centric as we want to be. But the folks at Henkel said, we've got to throw that out. We've got to start with ourselves. And so now my omni-channel team is all connected one group, okay? They don't have different managers with different agendas and, 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 and things of that nature. And, uh, and we're trying to create a frictionless experience for the consumer. We're trying to partner with the right technology companies and bring in the right data to make each touch point a better experience for consumers. And is this easy? No, it is not easy. Is there other obstacles? 100% every single day. And, and someday I'd love to just talk about that, you know, and how to kind of deal with some of those things. Um, but the most important thing, you know, is, is, is to David's point, um, and I don't know if David said this just now, or we had breakfast before, and I think he said it at breakfast, but, you know, to David, and I think to all of us, we recognize talent is the most important thing, right? As Jim Collins said in his book, book Good to Great, right, getting the right people on the bus, A number one doesn't matter where that bus is going. If you've got agile people, if you've got the right people. And so my job is to find the right people. And I think there are a few attributes that I'm going to share with you right now that I think are absolutely critical to modern marketers. And if you don't have that in the candidate, say thank you very much and move on to the next one. Number one, that's being an innovator. I look for people who are intellectually curious. They can't wait to bring outside knowledge into the organization and elevate us all. I look for people who are achievers. Boy, if you've got people who are ambitious and they want to grow and they look at the job as a way of being personally fulfilled, making it, it could be across any, any, any motivation, I look for those people. Boy, if you have ambitious people, as long as they behave properly and they're not leaving a bunch of dead bodies along the way to their success, if you, if you don't have that, that's another problem. But if you don't have that, these people don't need to be managed. You just set a vision and you just clear a path. Let them go. Um, experts. So I've got this omni-channel team and we all work together, but each person has a hip pocket skill. And I look for that too and I ask candidates, what's your hip pocket skill? So I have folks who are deep, deep, deep functional digital experts. I have folks who are deep, deep, deep shopper marketing experts. I have a woman in the call center and it's not a job for her. It's a vocation. It's a passion. And she sits right outside of my office. And I hear how she deals with some folks who call in. And they're not always very happy. Um, but boy, she is, she is a real expert in that space and teaching me every day how to treat people. Culture givers. I'm looking for people who, you know, it doesn't have to be everybody, put a little discretionary effort, right, into building the team, remembering birthdays, remembering you know, anniversaries, getting, you know, bugging me to get the team together to do a dinner or something fun. 
You know, I love people like that. That's great. And I think the force multiplier, the thread that ties all this together, is energy and optimism and agility. And I've worked with people who do not have this any, in, some of the, in any one of these components, and those people aren't going to last, right? I forget which uh, chief of staff said this, but um, a former, I think it was a, a former, former chief of staff said, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance a lot less. And boy, that statement could uh, certainly is super true. One of the other things I just will tell you is that in this age, we need digital citizens, right? You know, particularly in, in marketing. So there are digital deniers. And those are people who are really resting on their laurels and saying, yeah, I'm not buying this whole digital thing. There are, there are out there. There are digital tourists. And those are people who are dipping their toe in the water and say, yeah, digital's pretty cool, but they're not living it. I need digital citizens, people who are living digital. They're breathing it. They're active you know, in social media on a number of different platforms. They're reading blogs. They're listening to podcasts. They're watching vlogs. They may even publish. Super, super important, right? Because we're rethinking media at Henkel. We're rethinking consumer communication. It's no longer just about distribution channels, right? It's about technology. It's about content. It's about data. And it's about those distribution channels. And we think each one of these things can be a unique source of insight and business growth, right? So. One of my favorite guys, Muhammad Ali, I try to work him into every presentation. Um, we've got a one-two punch at Henkel when we think about modern marketing. Number one, you've got to take care of the basics, just making sure that build went up. Um, the basics is like digital fit, it's like marketing fitness, right? That'll let you go 15 rounds. You're not going to knock anybody out, but you can go the distance. I'll tell you about the knockout punch in a second. So what's modern marketing basics at Henkel? It's targeting, number one. Moving from a spray and pray, demo targeting, right, in the digital space, to leveraging data for more precise targeting. It's moving from a set it and forget it campaign approach to media optimizations every week, every other week, mid-campaign, at the end. It's partnerships. Picking the right partners, like the folks at Inmar, and others. You can't have 15 partners or 20 partners necessarily. You can have three or four really, really close partners. So we prioritize that. Having a learning agenda, right? What do we want to learn? How are we going to learn it through the campaigns and the things that we do? How are we going to, you know, share um, that learning agenda and those results with people? Advertising hygiene. I think a lot of you have heard that the digital marketing landscape is fraught with all kinds of chicanery, let's say. So you got to be on things like fraud and brand safety and viewability and on-target percentage. If you don't look after those things, a lot of bad things can happen, right? And then digital maturity. Once again, digital, digital, digital. So important. We'll talk more about digital maturity in a second. Now, here's the knockout punch. Here's how we're going to knock out the competition. Any folks from, from P&G in here? Get ready. Just kidding. Love you all. Love you all. We're all... This is how we're going to do it, though, OK? Our one-two punch, number one, number one is people and audiences, right? Having a data management platform, absolutely critical, because this becomes your audience hub, right? Number two, if you can get a DSP that's AI-powered, like we have, and, um, and connect it to that DMP, that's going to enable you to action on those insights. Number two, CRM, or consumer relationship management. How could we be consumer-centric? If we don't have an initiative to bring consumers into our story, right, and help them co-create it and learn more about them, and let that information feed the DMP. DCO, dynamic creative optimization. This is all about sequentially serving the right message to the right consumer at the right time, right, so that they feel the message is actually adding value. Ooh, I'm so glad I got that message from Ken at Henkel. Um, branded content. This is a little bit different for us. This is really about getting into the entertainment space. And I'll talk to you about that. It's about selling more by selling less. Really scary to say those words uh, to some people. Um, can feel a little career limiting, but we'll get into that. Shopper media. Shopper marketing cannot be a distinct function. It, it, is, it needs to be a strategic imperative. How do we bring shopper media into the broader you know, media planning? 
And then artificial intelligence. Everybody's heard about artificial intelligence, and it's absolutely critical that everybody in this room is involved in some capacity with artificial intelligence because it is the, uh, the fuel of the future. So here's the digital maturity map that we have. Once again, digital, 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 so important. For each of our brands, we plot them on this map, whether you're a novice, intermediate, advanced, expert, and we have attributes that correlate to those distinctions. And then we come up with a plan for each brand. How are we going to make sure you don't lose ground from where you are, but you grow? Right? You grow. And every year we look at the L2 report that comes out from Gartner and we try to ensure that we're moving our brands forward. But we create very, very robust digital strategies for each brand. Here's another thing, right? We're talking about that purchase funnel being broken, okay? But that still doesn't mean you can't think about, and you shouldn't think about your tactics, but it's about thinking about them a little bit differently. So for us, yes, this is linear because, you know, it's easy, right, to show you this. But by no means is our planning linear at all, right? Um, because we think of each tactic, right? And there has to be a discrete reason for that tactic to be on this map. And there have to be discrete objectives and KPIs. And we have to answer the question, where are we sending consumers next? And are we ready to receive them in that place? Because if I say, yes, I got my TVC, and that's running, great. I'm so happy, I'm gonna get all these impressions. Done, right? No, not done. Where do you want people to go? You want them to go to your website? Maybe you should tell them. Maybe you should have a super. How's your website looking? Is it mobile optimized? Is it mobile friendly? Ooh, no. You better fix that, right? Because consumers will dump out of you, you know, if, the, if your experience doesn't meet their expectations. And we think about, we don't care where the consumer jumps into our story, because we can't control that. So each piece has to live on its own, yet be connected to the broader ecosystem of what we're trying to do with our campaign. What really riles me is when partners come in and they say, yeah, we're doing this on social media, we got this plan for you over here on search. You know, what gets me a little bit nuts in my seat is when they're not talking about the ecosystem. Why am I doing this thing? And how does it fit to everything else that you want me to get, that you're recommending I do to reach my objectives? Leveraging big data, bringing the consumer into view, right? Super important. So we get data from all different sources, and we bring that into our DMP. We're on a hunt for really good data. And I can tell you right now, outside of the registration data that we get um, and the purchase-based behavior uh, uh, data that we get from IRI and Nielsen, the other data sources, big question mark. So we're kind of on a test and learn to find the right third-party data that enables us to build better and better models. Um, and eventually, we'd like to rely less and less on that. But the purpose is all about identity resolution. We want to bring the consumer into view. If right now we only have cookie data, they're pretty anonymous to us, right? The more data we get, they start to come into view. And ultimately, if we get registration data, we have the cookie data, um, we've got you know, behavioral data, from them uh, by tracking their mobile devices, we'll have a really clear picture of who our high value audiences are and what their identities are across terrestrial, device, and digital. That's what we want. All right? And this is actually working for us because when we started out in this game and we were doing digital and we were demo using digital, uh, uh, demo, we were doing, doing demo targeting um, similar to TV, our ROAS was not good. But when we brought a little bit of purchase-based data into that targeting uh, approach, our ROAS got significantly better. And then when we got rid of demo targeting and we relied on purchase-based seed audiences and we built models off of that and we let the AI in the, in the data, um, in the demand side platform help us optimize media delivery, our ROAS got a whole lot better. And we believe as we build out our CRM program, when we get read more and more registration data in, we'll build better models, right? Every model is wrong, right? It's wrong. Every model is wrong. But some models are useful. It's about creating more models that are more useful. And we think our ROAS is going to go through the roof the more we get um, registration data. Value. This is like one of my favorite, this is my favorite topic. Because not only because I just personally love this topic, 
but according to Nielsen, the CMO report that they published last year, everything I just talked to you about, all the targeting, accounts for 16% of sales. What accounts for the most amount of sales? David knows, he was just about to tell me, it's creative, it's creative, it's the message. 46% of sales is what you say and how you say it, right? So we want to become publishers of, of epic content. Because when we talk about this notion of value, this platform of value, we all understand value starts with the, the product and the service, right? And the price that we offer. But we know today we have to expand that value proposition in order to distinguish ourselves from the competition. How are we going to do that? Well, some brands are becoming publishers of epic content. You know, content that people subscribe to, that they anticipate, that um, enables brands to open a two-way dialogue with, right? Uh, to, to, and to help customers shape that brand story. It enables brands to get more information from consumers because they're bought in, right? And we can better serve them with more tailored content. And there are a number of brands out there who are great, great role models, right? Red Bull, for one, I mean, they generate at least half their revenue from the content that they develop, the TV shows, the movies, the events. I mean, I think they sell an energy drink still, but I really know them for the magazines and for all the sports that I watch on TV. This is my, you know, I love Patagonia, right? They don't send me a product catalog. They send me a lifestyle magazine, which is filled with stories. And they are truly selling more by selling less because they're selling me a dream, right? I want to be this guy. Actually, some days I am that guy, actually. It's one time I can actually say that. Um, but I want to be more of this guy. And they bring me into these stories every day. And all of a sudden, I just find myself just buying their stuff. You know, and I love their stories. And while there's a lot of really good role models out there, all brands need to be on their own and find their own content niche, their own content platform by which to publish, right? And we have to be the best publishers in the world around that content niche. Because consumers can get content from anywhere, right? Why should they come to me? If I want to expand my value proposition and talk about different things other than the, the features and benefits and the, and the more undistinguishable things about my product, then I've got to be the best in the world. Whew, that's daunting, but I love it, right? So at Henkel, we leverage artificial intelligence to help us figure out what should our content niche be? We're a laundry, home care, beauty company. What should we start writing about? There's so many options. But we leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us scrape the web for all the conversations and all the things people were reading about our product categories, right? And, and, and this helped us understand the topics, the challenges and the engagement level that our consumers had around reading and talking about certain topics that were adjacent, relevant to our product categories. And what we found was support for moms, home, and health rose to the top. Support for moms, wow, that seems rich. You know, and, and, and if you look on this chart here, support for moms is in the top right, meaning it's got the most published content and the most engagement. So we said, whoa, that's where we want to be, right? That seems like a great territory. But there's this low-hanging fruit here, right, in cleaning tips and, 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 and chores and parenting, those types of things. Now, our competition is all over that space, but we've got to be there too. So we're like, okay, how are we going to differentiate ourselves in this very important space? And so we looked at sentiment and the machine was able to tell us that of all the published content out there, the kind of yellowish mustard color bar represents neutral sentiment, right? I mean, the sentiment was just without, a, the uh, sentiment of the articles was, was without emotion. The conversation was without emotion. So we're like, whoa, we could really kind of add some emotional resonance to some of these topics. I'll give you one right now that'll definitely get you They'll definitely trigger your emotions, okay? So cleaning tips and tricks, right? How do you get emotional with that, right? How can you make that emotional? Well, did you know that your pillow doubles in weight based on sweat, dust, and skin particles? But you can clean that pillow and bring it back to new with all free clear. 
which we happen to sell. 99% kills 99% of germs and bacteria. Do I have your attention on that one, right? It's emotional, right? it's emotional. So we can take tips and tricks in a whole other direction. But what about the support for moms, right? So we use machine learning to go even deeper and drill, drill in, you know, and what does that mean? Family and relationships, community and friends, work-life balance, parents and nostalgia, pets. These things rose to the top. And so then we said, okay, this is all super, super interesting, but what's our way in? And, and that's where we put the machine learning down. And that's where we opened our hearts. And these authors, I love these guys, Dan and Chip Heath, they're brothers. And they came out with this book called The Power of Moments. And I, I highly recommend you read that book. Um, and it, it, it just inspired us all. Because in the book they say, all of our lives, right, are really about little moments. But where do we live our lives? We live our lives in the future, the next meeting, the next presentation, the next vacation. We're not right here, right now with you. Well, I am. I'm right here, right now with you. I don't know your name, but I'm right here, and I'm right now with you. And, and that's the point, right? So we're thinking, wow, how can we help mom make those little moments more special? So, and how, how are we going to relate that back to our products? So, for example, one of the ideas we came up with was, what if we had a movie night? I know what you're thinking, a movie night, yeah, sure, we've seen that a million times. But what if there was a movie night with a lesson? Now, and I took this from, actually, this idea from my own experience. My son came home one day, and he was just distraught. He's a very good student, but he was distraught. He had gotten a couple of you know, very poor grades in a row. And he was just on his heels, didn't, didn't know what to do. And I said, did you ever see the movie Rocky? He goes, Dad, what are you talking about? Rocky? What's that? He's 16. I said, let's sit down, let's watch this movie, and let's have a chat about it afterwards. We'd watch the movies like, Dad, I get it. I, I know what you're going to say. It's about resilience, it's about fighting back. I said, that's exactly it. I said, I don't care how smart you are. At the end of the day, that is not going to drive your success. Right? Your determination, your persistence, like Rocky, that will drive your success. And we, we had a great conversation, and one of us cried a little bit. It wasn't him, right? <laughs> so, whoa, there's emotional resonance. There's, you know, and then how do you bring your products into that? Well, if you set your couch up with pillows and blankets that you've washed in all and, and snuggle, it'll smell great, it'll be clean, it'll create a nice, cozy experience for yourself, right? Selling more by selling less. Right. Now, I'd love to tell you more about this program. We haven't launched it yet. It's coming in back half of this year. But the bottom line story is data and uh, art and science is helping us find a platform to stand above the swirl of all the trade noise and all the advertising campaigns to reach over all that stuff and grab consumers right in the heart. Couldn't do it without data. We couldn't do it without emotion. And we plan on leveraging this content beyond, our, beyond a CRM program, which will be the mainstay of that. We're going to feed the whole marketing mix. Can you imagine what this content's going to do to our SEO by baking it into our websites? Now, on a separate note, we're getting into selling more by selling less. This is the one thing that has executives at our company really antsy, and I love it. Um, and it makes me a little uncomfortable too, quite frankly. This is about us getting into the entertainment business. We're producing eight five-minute episodes for one of our beauty brands, and it follows a fictional story of a young girl on her kind of course of self-discovery within a music kind of um, environment. I don't want to give too much away because it also hasn't released yet. And our products, the brand manager came back from the shoot. She was livid. She's like, our products aren't even, they're in barely in any of the episodes. And we said, that's exactly the point. And the VP of the business is like, I don't know how this is going to work. You know, so they're all looking at us. Is this going to be a big colossal waste of money or not? But we're like, no, it's not going to be a colossal waste of money because you don't have to tell the same story everywhere at all times. We're going to have this video content, but we're going to have lots of outtakes, lots of stills, lots of big hero brand imagery associated with this content that will feed the entire marketing mix. More people will see that content, which is on-brand strategy 100%, than ever see the episode, ever see the series. 
but enough of our consumers will see that series and they'll say, hmm, this brand is for me. And so we're very excited about testing selling more by selling less. Personalization, right? E-Marketer um, e said that the U.S. Uh, that retail sales will hit 5.7 trillion dollars by 2021, and Accenture says there's a three trillion dollar prize for companies that adopt smart digital strategies that personalize the customer experience, right? That make that experience smoother, better for consumers by serving them what they want kind of when they want it. So important, right? Because 81 percent of consumers expect brands to know them and expect brands to know when to talk with them and when not to talk with them, right? 51% of consumers expect brands to predict their needs and they want tailored solutions offered to them very early on in the relationship. And all this personalization is awesome news for us because 49% of consumers say they make impulse purchases and they spend more than they ever planned on spending when they receive personalized messages, right? So personalization at the end of the day is knowing your consumer really well and using that knowledge to solve their problems, right? And at Henkel, we have a really interesting thing, and I'll tell you, because I, I have a little time to do this. Um, in, in the notion of innovation, and innovation not just coming from product silos, we have a group called Henkel X. And it's run by our chief digital officer, who's only, that position's only about a year old in our company. And he brings startups. So what he does is his team goes deep on, on, on our strategies, on the country strategy. So he's, this team is, in, in, is a global team. They work with countries specifically to understand their strategies and bring startups to them. And we just had three, we had a startup day where these startups came to us and they were super relevant to our business needs. And I'm gonna pursue two of them. Um, and I can't wait when I get back to the office. This is a similar case where the chief digital officer brought us a company called R4. Um, these are for the founders of Priceline.com, and they're fantastic as it pertains to machine learning. And they're helping us find the hidden customer, the customer who should be buying more of our products and, and, and buying more at specific retailers. So this is a use case that we're doing for one of our top retailers where we're looking for high potential Persil shoppers, right? And um, we, we are using machine learning to identify where these shoppers live at the zip code and the sub-zip code level, at the block group level. And we're using machine learning to understand the attributes that comprise the communities at the block level. That's one city block, right? So that we can deliver more tailored messages to these people. We're going to be more efficient with our media. We're going to dig a marketing moat around our high potential consumers and serve them ads that are super relevant to them and drive them to specific retail locations. Really excited about that. And we're going to put all these audiences into our DMP. And the neat thing about a data management platform is you can score people, right? And you can put people into different groups. We can really identify high value audiences and understand the lifetime value of these groups and keep learning and learning and learning about these people and model off of these people to deliver personalization at scale, right? Convenience. Convenience, and I'll have one slide on convenience, but it's super, super important, but based on time, the dream is to have millions of people on our data management platform and to segment them by customer. Where do they shop most? And to understand what specific problems we need to solve across their unique journeys and to serve them the right message, right, that's very related to that customer. Right? And we're doing this right now with dynamic ads that serve the right product to the right consumer at the right price in the right market at the right time. And I'm going to show you a video on how we did that as my last kind of slide. In 2018, Henkel developed and executed its first ever one-to-one -one video advertising campaign to accelerate sales for Gliss hair care products. Henkel identified and partnered with an advanced ad tech provider that built a highly qualified messaging segmentation strategy, aligned messaging with each consumer, adapted video across devices, and used NCS to measure return on ad spend. Each video was infused with custom creative elements that included dynamic regional callouts, 
seamless integration of logos branding, dynamic offer scenes, and dynamic map scenes. Using iView's advanced targeting capabilities, each video version was catered to a specific audience based on known Gliss and Schwarzkopf buyers, lapsed Gliss and Schwarzkopf buyers, or non-loyal buyers. These video versions were targeted to consumers within a tight radius of participating retailers to promote a total of 22,999 unique store locations. Over the duration of the campaign, 408,275 unique video versions were generated reaching 15.2 million unique users. The campaign made 18.8 .8 million impressions with 12.1 million completions for a completion rate of 64%. The campaign efficiently drove an 8% sales lift. So that's what we're up to at Henkel, and I'll leave you just with this final quote from um, one of the great marketers of all time, Mario Andretti. Just kidding, great driver, but a great quote. If everything seems under control, you're not moving fast enough, right? So I think it's fine to feel uncomfortable, to feel nervous. I think it's fine when I look across the desk at our board members and we're talking about branded content and they're squirming in their seats, you know, because I think about this quote in my head. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Look forward to chatting with you more later.